Welcome to What's New in MPMI, the virtual seminar series of the MPMI Journal. I'm Jean Harris, I'm the Editor-in-Chief. And while we're waiting for people to join, um, why don't you type into the chat where you're from? We have Mojita Mohammadi from uh, USDA Palmetto, Florida. We have Daniel Eboli from Texas A&M. Where, who, where else are people from? I see we have a lot of participants today. We have um, Arpan Kumar Basek from Krakow, Poland. Kaustav Ganguly from St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, Memphis. And Sridhar Ranganathan from Chennai, India. Okay. So, Okay, so now that we've got everybody um, joining on the call, we have, I'd like to say welcome again to what's new in MPMI. Uh, our speaker, speaker today is Preetha Ganguly and with me is Dong Wang, who is co-host. Dong is uh, a senior editor at MPMI and has, uh, his specialty is also in this area. And before we start, I wanted to remind people to submit to our upcoming focus issue on the endomembrane system and its involvement in molecular plant microbe interactions. And Dong is one of the um, guest editors of that issue. Do you wanna say a word about that, Dong? Yeah, so this is a topic that we feel very excited about. Um, we know there are a lot of things going on when two organisms interact very closely and what's really been an explosion of research are those bicycle trafficking, both within each organism as they talk to each other, and also sometimes you know, extracellular vesicles as they communicate uh, directly with each other. So if you have you know, a nice story, whether it's a review article or it's a, a research manuscript, we look forward to, we encourage you to consider MPMI, we look forward to reading your manuscripts. Thank you. Yes, and um, Karen has typed uh, the link to the information about our focus issue into the chat. So please follow it up. Uh, I should tell you, we also will be including things like technical advances and short communications. So hope to have your papers in that issue of MPMI. I also wanted to let people know about uh, that MPMI is doing something special this year. We are offering an $800 discount for papers with a student first author. So this is an opportunity for us to uh, support uh, students and our, our early career researchers. And Karen has typed that link in as well. And that um, special offer continues through the end of June. So I hope that, um, that you will take advantage of this. And I just wanna point out that our last speaker was a graduate student as is today's speaker, uh, Preetha Ganguly, who is just completing her graduate work. And we've had some really excellent papers submitted to MPMI from with graduate student first authors. So this is your opportunity. Finally, if you would be interested in helping us to edit the Zoom transcript to make sure that it is fully accessible to everyone, we would really appreciate that. So if you are interested in helping in this effort, please type into the chat. The Zoom transcript will be created so you aren't doing it from scratch, but as you know by now, Zoom only, you know, but that live captioning only does so well with um, scientific words and people's names. So this is your chance to help make this more accessible when we post the recorded version. Okay, so, um, so now let's start with our seminar. I'm very pleased to introduce Preetha Ganguly from the University of Kolkata. She's coming from Moitri Dasgupta's lab, who has um, done a lot of work on peanut and the rhizobium legume symbiosis, uh, focusing also on the biochemical side, but, but quite a bit on evolution as well. So delighted to have this as a part. Um, I was particularly intrigued by this paper when it came through MPMI because it is a story of a long non-coding RNA that has its own long non-coding RNA. And those layers upon layers of regulation 
I think tell us something very interesting about the plant and also about plant microbe interactions. So that was why I invited Pitha to give today's seminar and I will turn it over to you, Pritha, and please share your screen. And while she's doing that, I just want to remind people that we will be taking questions from um, typed into the Q&A box. So you can type them into the Q&A box at any time during the talk, and we will follow your questions at that point. We will not be taking questions in the chat. Okay, Pritha, over to you. Thank you, Jane, for this wonderful introduction. So, yeah, I have not, just not shared my screen. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Hi, I'm Pritha Ganguly. I'm currently pursuing my PhD under Professor Moitri Dashgupto at the Department of Biochemistry, University of Calcutta in India. At the outset, I want to thank Professor Jean Harris and her entire team for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work that has been recently been published in MPMI titled The Natural Antisense Transcript. The Natural Antisense Transcript yeah, uh, is this. We can see your pointer, everything's good. Yeah, okay. Just a sec. The natural antisense transcript done for the, uh, from the you know, LNCRNA not for the locus interacts with the said domain protein SHR3 during inception of symbiosis in Arachis hypogea. So before going into our work, I would like to briefly go through our perspective to highlight why we attempted this work. And then I would give a brief background on in 40 So this phylogenetic tree I have borrowed is from Toby Kiel's Nature Communication, where they stated that a single evolutionary that a single evolutionary innovation drives the deep evolution of symbiotic nitrogen fixation in angiosperms. This start denotes the point of origin or predisposition, which gave rise to two types of symbiosis. One, actinolysal symbiosis with a gram-positive franchia and leguminous symbiosis with a gram-negative rhizobia. So to understand about this point of origin, I will now borrow this simple scheme from Swano Science Plants already had this functional symbiotic pathway, uh, functional symbiotic pathway due to mycorrhiza, and they also utilized auxin pathway for this formation of lateral root primordia. Now, plants utilized both these available toolkits. They recruited a metabolic sensor neem, which ultimately leads to formation of nodal primordia for the endocytic accommodation of this endosymbionts. So there is a lot of international interest in understanding this molecular nature of the origin of symbiosis, and our lab also shares the interest. Now, there is a diversity in developmental process during root nodule symbiosis. For example, in actinorhizal nodule, which is actually a modified lateral root, we can see a central vasculature with a very perpetual meristem, whereas in leguminous nodule, that we can see the, uh, which, is, which are modified or uh, no, novel organs caused by cortical cell divisions. We can see peripheral, uh, peripheral vasculature and there may be present or absent of this meristem. Similarly, there is also diversity in the bacterial invasion process. The, the most prevalent method is by uh, through the hollow tubes in the root hairs known as infection thread but in 25% of the cases, as marked in the phylogenetic tree, bacteria can enter through the natural cracks in the epidermis. And one such example of this crack entry legume is Arachis hypogea, where our entire work was undertaken. 
Now, before going into uh, Inot 40 background, I want to share a very interesting uh, observation which was published from our lab much before I joined for PhD, which showed that on downregulation of a common symbiotic pathway gene, CKMK, leads to lateral root formation from the nodular apex, which means it started showing actual arousal features. Similarly, from Hassan Gasby's lab, it was shown that on downregulating CMRK, there was also increase in the number of these nodular roots. So with these observations, we can see the, say that there is a thin layer of overlap between the developmental procedures of this actinocell nodule and this arachis nodule. So with this, if I start going the background on Inot 40, I would like to state the most interesting fact that Inot 40 is not required during nodulation in actinocell plants. So it is, we can say that it is required in legumes. So what is this Inot 40? All our understanding about Inot 40 is majorly from the work done by Professor Martin Crispy and his lab. Inot 40 is a long non-coding RNA, which has two conserved regions, one and two. The conserved region one has the potential to encode a short peptide, which is conserved in all legumes, non-legumes, and other actinocell plants. Whereas the conserved region two is shown to provide the stability to the RNA. Now, uh, Inot 40 was discovered in the early, uh, much before the other LNC RNAs that we know about. It was discovered 25 years back, and it is one of the first plant LNC RNAs to be discovered. So, in these three decades, what we have understood about this long non coding RNA is that they take part in different developmental programs, mainly by modifying the chromatin structures. And now if I go in, uh, if I just tell about the functional role of Inot 40, as demonstrated by many investigators, Inot 40 expression is associated with vasculature, vascular system. In the paper published from Katharina Pawlowski's lab, we, they have shown that Inot 40 is expressed in both actinorazal nodule as well as, as well as in the leguminous nodule. But the primary role of Inot 40 in legume is said to be the induction of cortical cell division. And Inot 40 expression is said to precede much early and precede the cell, even the cell division process. So this figure is from the Crispy's, uh, Martin Crispy's paper, and this is from uh, Bisling, the FITMAP paper on Medica Prankatula, where they have cap, uh, compared the expression of Inot 40 during lateral root and the nodule development. Finally, in molecular level, Inot 40 is known to interact with the nuclear, nuclear protein RBP1, which is also known as the NSR1 or the nuclear speckle, speckle RNA binding protein. And it helps in translocation of this RBP from nucleus to cytoplasmic granule. This NSR is known to be involved in splicing, but the exact targets due to uh, in root nodal symbiosis is yet not known. And also trap experiments showed that Inot 40 is associated with translational machineries, but the exact functions is yet to be understood. So with this background in mind, our objective was to understand the role of Inot 40 during root nodal symbiosis in this crack and trigum arachis hypogea. Firstly, we did a blast search with the all available, all, all with the all available Inot 40 sequence in the NCBI database, and it was interesting to find that Inot 40 matches uh, hits with the chromosome five, chromosome fifteen, chromosome three, and chromosome thirty. In case of chromosome five and fifteen, matches were only found with the chromo uh, conserved regions one and two, whereas in chromosome three and thirteen, hits were match hits match only with the conserved region two. So we further checked our expression profile from our transcriptome data, and we saw that with the progress of symbiosis, the expression of from chromosome 5 and 15 increases, whereas there was no such change in the chromosome 3 and 30. To study the biological significance of this Inot 40 in Arachis hypogea, we did our downregulation. Uh, so there was around 66 to 83% reduction in the expression of Inot 40. 
and around 80% of the transformed nodules were reduced. For microscopic analysis, in microscopic analysis, we could see that in the control nodule, the cells were equally, uh, the cells were deferited and had spherical symbiosomes. Whereas in the down-regulation, down-regulated nodule, uh, nodules, there were presence of undifferentiated uh, and rod-shaped bacteria. So for the symbiotic readout, we performed, uh, we checked the expressions of genes like neen and cyclops, whereas there was no such significant change in case of neen, as we can say that in our is much downstream to neen, but there was significant reduction in the expression of cyclops. So we can hypothesize that this may be a part of the feedback mechanism. Uh, when we were performing all these experiments, our collaborators were actually annotating the long non-coding RNAs in our strand-specific transcriptome. And they found a very interesting observation. The, play, uh, the region where we could find hits with the other E-naught-40s, they find, found that contigs were available from both the strands in that region. So contigs from the positive strand is marked in green in all through the slide and context from the negative strand is marked in red. So E-40 sequences matched with the, you know, were found to be transcribed from the negative strand, which is marked in red. And it comprises of two exons, one a shorter exon followed by a larger exon. And the other transcript match or, or encompassed majorly the second larger exon and primary and a part of the intron. So this E-40 is, Possesses two exons, whereas the antisense transcript, which we have turned as DUN40, comprises of single exon. Uh, so this is the first time we could note that there is a presence of two exons in case of E-40, and also there is a presence of natural antisense transcript of E-40, which is also known as DUN40 now. So when they checked in the chromosome 15 region also, they could find that the only contigs were available from the positive uh, strand, which has marked by green. And it also comprises of a smaller exon followed by a larger exon. And this E-41 and two from chromosome five and 15 shares around nine, more than 98% similarity. And the only difference between these two transcripts is the insertion of a 28 base pair in the ORF2 region of E-41, which we use as a marker to differentiate between these two. So we can say that DAN40 is actually acting as a cis natural antisense transcript for E-41 and a trans natural antisense for E-42. So like in the animal system, it's well characterized as a sense antisense LNC RNA pair like cis T6 or the mallet one, talem one. This is the first time we can say that we are reporting a sense antisense LNC RNA pair for plants, which is a DAN40 and E-40 in this, in, in this study. <clears throat> so we, also validated this presence of the two exons in E-41 and the monoexonic in the DAN40 in, uh, by pcr Bates method. And we further checked their expression. Uh, E-40 as well as the DAN40 was found to be expressed, uh, was found to be expressed with the progress of symbiosis. And they were uh, expressing in both the nuclear fraction as well as the cytoplasmic part. Similarly, uh, DAN40 was also expressed in the nuclear fraction as well as the uh, cytoplasmic part. And DAN40 is, an uh, expression of DAN40 increases from the four, uh, four days post infection time point, time point. Sorry. So, with the discovery of DAN40, we looked back in our uh, RNAi data and we found that all the three transcripts, both the E040s as well as the DAN40, were round, down regulated in the RNAi nodulated root uh, tissues. So we could say that DAN40 along with E040 is involved in the root nodule, nodule in Arachis hypogea. So we further proceeded for our next objective and we were looking for the potential interactors of DAN40. As I've just mentioned that DAN40 expression increases from the four DPI time, po time point, it was also published from our lab in the Arachis transcriptome paper that there is a major transcriptional switch that operates between this 4 DPI and 8 DPI time point. So we were looking for interactors which were in a, 
involved in this early time point in the root nodal symbiosis. So for that, we did uh, RNA pull down assay. We actually bioterrorized the RNA, bound it with a streptavidin magnetic bead, and we allowed it to mix with the whole protein lysate at the four days post-infection routes. And we studied the interacting proteins by the mass spectroscopy. The first hit that we found was from a set domain transcriptional regulator from the Arabidopsis thaliana. So we looked back in the Arabidopsis database and we found that this set domain transcription regulator is part of the trisodic group protein. So we looked in our Arachis database and we searched for all the set domain containing trisodic group protein. And we found these 50 proteins to be uh, containing the set domain and was part of the trisodic group protein. We appended, appended all the sequences of these 50 proteins with the Arabidopsis thaliana database and we looked for the sources of the proteins that were interacting with DAN40. We found these three peptides to be interacting and they belong to these proteins. Interestingly, whose expression was also increased with the, at the four to eight DPI time point. We further validated this interaction in both in vitro as well as in vivo method. For in vitro validation, we performed electrophoretic mobility shift assay. We radio labeled the RNA and allowed it to bind with the protein where we could see shifted bands. And we increased the level of non-labeled self-competitors as well as the non-self-competitors. So with the self-competitors, the, there was decrease in the bound fractions, which was not found with the non-self-competitors. So we can say that the DAN40 specifically binds to SHR3. So, and for in vivo validation, we overexpressed expressed SHR3 fused with GFP and we did uh, RNA minute precipitation and we saw that there is high enrichment of the DAN40 transcript in the immunoprecipitate. So we can say that DAN40 directly and specifically binds with the SHR3. Now what is known about SHR3 is that it contains, uh, in the, our case, it contains two PhD domain followed by a domain associated with SET. A SET domain having the uh, methyl transferase property followed by the cysteine rich post set domain. SHR3 has been previously shown to control cell division in the competence of root male stem in Arabidopsis. It acts as a histone methyl uh, transferase in the H3K36 position. And H3K36 methylation is also engaged in alternative splicing by recruiting the splicing mechanism in both plants and animals. So uh, with this thing, we further wanted to check as, as DAN40 was interacting with SHR3 and this polycom trithorax response elements uh, like the this LNC RNA gets transcribed into LNC RNA and they bind to the RNA uh, and they get bind with this uh, RNA and loop back to the same locus. So we search for cis motifs in the inot 40 loci. We searched for many motifs, but we could find enrichment of this phi, GA, and ULT1 motif in the inot 40 loci. So we can say, uh, we can probably uh, hypothesize that this inot 40 may act as a response element for polycomb or trithorax, which functions antagonist to each other. Further, we wanted to study the land, histone modification landscape in the loci. For that, we performed cheap assays in using the activation marks as H3K36 trimethylation, H3K4 trimethylation, H3K27 acetylation, H3K9 acetylation. And we also checked the repressive marks, H3K27 trimethylation. So there was no such enrichment of the repressive marks, but there was high enrichment of the activating marks of which H3K36 trimethylation is the mark deposited by SHR3. So with these results, we can uh, hypothesize a model based on the model proposed by Professor Ringrose that from the same locus, which is enriched with the response elements of for polycom and trithorax, both sense as well as the antisense, that is inot 40 as well as the DAN40 are getting transcribed. The DAN40 is interacting with the trithorax root protein, which is in our case SHR3. It may also interact with other factors like any other transcription factor. 
and this lnc rna guides these complex to the back in the same locus where they gets deposited and and deposits their mark in which is in our case h2k36 trimethylation in the locus for its further activation if we elaborate this model we can say that chromatin uh, of the chromosome 5 is in the inactive domain the, when the Danforte gets transcribed, it recruits the SHR3 protein, which sub, uh, deposits uh, its 3K36 trimethylation marks and let the chromatin from the inactive domain for the, in the active domain. And it is interesting to see that in the near vicinity of this in for telosi, there is presence of various major symbiotic re related genes like Simarchaeo and Cyclops and others. So we further uh, went to uh, we further showed the congruence between SHR3 as well as A040. But, uh, we can see that in the phylogenetic tree, SHR3 and A040 clustered in a similar way, where they segregated in legume, non-symbiotic, and the actinorazole pattern. And considering their involvement during root development. And such congruence between this phylogeny and phenotype indicates the E040 and SHR3 association due to nodule development. Further, I want to show you a glimpse that we have also published in the paper about the locus interne around E040. So E040 is not annotated in any of the genomes. So we use the neighboring gene YLS7 to study the synteny. Now, YLS7 is also known as trichome birefringence, which is predicted to possess acetyltransferase activity or pectin esterase activity, or in short, we can say that it's predicted to have a cell wall modifying property. So when we calculated the positions of YLS7 and U040, we could see that U040 shares a tight synteny with YLS7 in all the legumes, but it may be noted in Ascainomini evenia, E040 is expressed from two chromosomes, chromosome three and in chromosome five. The symbiotic related E040 is expressed from chromosome three in case of Ascainomini evenia, where the synteny is not found between YLS7. So we can say that there may be some dependency on the not factors with this synteny. And if we further elaborate this model between uh, the legumes, non-legumes, and the actinorazole plant. And in this chart, we have the positions of YLS7 as well as A040. As I have mentioned, in case of legumes, they share a very close and tight synteny, whereas in the non-legumes or the non-symbiotic plants, the E040 and YLS7 are situated in totally different chromosomes. But the situation is much complex in case of actinorhizum. But only in case of casuarina, we could find the entire stretch of E040, which is in a convergence synteny with YLS7. But in this case, the YLS7 is in, in a truncated version. In other cases, the YLS7 and E040 may are in the divergent, uh, divergent uh, share the divergence uh, synteny, or they may be in the different, uh, altogether in the different chromosome. So summing, uh, so we can uh, they say this, this YLS7 and E040 association, it may be strictly found in the legumes. So summing up with all my work, we can uh, by this, the Dan40 RNA, which is antisense transcript of E040, is expressed from the same locus in Arachis hypogea. This E040 and Dan40 is the first example of plant sense antisense LNC RNA pair. The DAN40 interacts with ASHR3, which is a part of Prithorax group protein, and it clearly demonstrates the involvement of these major histone modifiers during root nodal symbiosis. E040, since it's enriched with all the cis motifs, appears to act as a potential polycom and Prithorax response elements. And the tight synteny between AYLS7 and E040, which is only noted in legumes, suggests that this association may have a role in rhizobia legume symbiosis. So this is the entire team. The entire work was done in Professor Moitra Dashukto's lab and under her extreme supervision. Deepan Roy, who worked with us and equally contributed to the work, he is now in Durham University, UK. 
all the rni parts and the microscopic studies were majorly done by onindo kundu he is who is also in uk right now in nyab and dr jumur ghosh and her student roy helped us immensely with all the transcriptomic study and all the vital informations about astinomy was provided by dr fabian cartex from france and i want to also thank the instrumental facilities from the biochemistry department see ongaka university bose institute and isohopata and lastly but not the least the funding agencies thank you thank you preetha for that very interesting talk uh, really enjoyed it um so many good things i'm seeing in the chat people are typing wow so it it was a huge amount of work and really uncovered some interesting things so i just want to remind people to type your questions into the q and a and we will take turns um asking the questions um if you could stop sharing your screen pizza then we will um we will join yep thank you so um while we're waiting for um some questions to come in to the q and a there was a lot there and i'm sure people are are still thinking my gosh um long non coding rnas trithorax polycomb um histone modifications what wasn't involved uh, it's 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 lovely how you were able to take this strange transcriptome observation with the um antisense rna all the way through um to something very mechanistic um I'd like to ask a question before the others come through and one of one thing I was wondering about was um there seemed to be so many twists and turns to this story what um what were what was one of the big surprises to you uh as a scientist going through this project so the first thing that surprised us was the presence of this long known antisense long known coding rna it was only possible because we did had this trans specific transcriptome so that was the first thing that was we, we were surprised to see and like uh, the lnc rna interaction with other you know other histone modifiers is well classified even in plant system in case of flc so the involvement of these trithorax protein in all these nodulation pathway is another interesting fact that we could add Yeah that that whole antisense of an antisense was what caught my eye right when I first started looking at your paper. Um Don so uh, on related I mean a related question then is uh, I imagine this uh Don Forte that's a poly identity uh transcript right? Yeah. Yeah so so do you do you see it in other species as well? Uh we have studied it in a few of the legumes we can see uh, we can preliminarily say that yeah we have seen in the presence of dan 40 in one of the other legumes but yeah more work has to be come up with this before we can say that yeah it's mm. present in all the legumes and the um i've also been thinking about this ashr3 protein that you fish out uh, from mass spec uh yeah is it known to bind are is this no as known as a rna binding protein or this is the first time you show that no, no, no. it has been previously shown that shr3 the z domain containing these proteins can bind both this rna and the dna mm. which part of the which which domain binds in a, uh, the bind domain RNA? encompassing the aws set and the post set they are known to interact with these both dna and rna so ah. yeah we have tried with the chimera version also yeah they interacts with the rna also from a biotechnology point of view i was wondering what do you think it's possible that that you could change some of the sequences of the antisense rna to still bind the set domain but maybe target another gene um to change its histone modification i wonder i i feel like there are a lot of possibilities there yeah there can be other possibilities of acting is as a trans uh, trans lnc rna but yeah more work need to be done before we can we can only hypothesize at this moment 
Yes, yeah. So I see some of the questions are coming into the chat. If you could please type them into the Q&A, then we will get at those. Well, maybe I can start by this one in the, in the chat box already. So uh, Mojitaba Mohammadi uh, was asking whether you have been the similar work, whether it has been done in soybean in their interaction with Brady rhizobium. So by, by similar work, I, I imagine you not you not 40 or, or they are anti or it's anti-sense. So we have not seen in Swabin, but yeah, we have seen in some other legumes. So now yeah, the work needs to be come up because before we can conclude because there's a preliminary results with that we have found but yeah more work to be uh, come up so we before we can conclude that yeah the presence of dan 14 other parts i was curious did you pull out any other potential binding proteins or was it was the shr3 the ash R3, no, the one we, that you just followed up on. No, actually, we found uh, various kinds of other proteins, even they were presence of other translational proteins. So, but we could only see that we have predicted them to be interacting. We have not seen the in vivo validations or in vitro validations of exactly how the specifically or, or directly binding to them. So we didn't uh, comment on those. We have just predicted them, them to be by interacting. But since we have validated ASHR3 thoroughly, so we have published that, yeah, it's interacting with ASHR3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just <clears throat> curious. I think I suspect that that this you just this is the tip of the iceberg and you're gonna find um yeah, it, it maybe it's a with... part of a, it may be you know, a part of a, a larger complex, but yeah, it's, we have yeah, not talk... been able to uh, comment on that. Mm -hmm. While well, talking about I mean, tip of iceberg, there's a question from Gustav Ganguly, who is asking whether you know that interaction is based on sequence or, or, or structure, I guess, the uh, structure or secondary structure of the RNA. So this is uh, basically a structure-based interaction. So we performed, we actually heat denatured the RNA and we uh, saw that there was no such kind of interaction with the RNA and the protein. Mm -hmm. So we can predict that the yeah, it's uh, mainly based on the structure of the protein uh, RNA. Very interesting. Yeah. Then uh, interesting. a related question in the in the chat I see is that uh, you can make you can change the sequence of either the anti sense I guess or the sense or the sense whatever that means right in this case uh, so that in the the sequence of the anti-sense, the, the down 40 no longer correspond 100% to the endogenous in not 40, what will happen in that case? So, uh, come, uh, I didn't follow your question. Can I just repeat it again? Yeah, so this is a question from uh, Aninda Tandu uh, asking, what do you think will happen if you always express a down 40 that is resistant to E not forty. I I guess by resistant, uh, she, yeah, she meant is that the two sequences are no longer entirely complementary to each other. So the anti sense if it is no longer well, or sense the E not forty transcript no longer is complementary to the sequence of the down forty. Yeah, would that have any effect? Um, okay, here, yeah, that's, here, um, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, further, what needs to be done? That's a very interesting question. So, we, yeah, we have to do some further work so we can comment on this thing also. Mm -hmm. That is interesting because it does raise the question of um, sort of timing that, you know, if something's as potent really as ENOD 40 <laughs> for inducing cortical cell divisions, you know, at some point you need to tamp that down. And so um, what would happen if there was no done 40 to do that? So that's a really interesting question. Just a reminder to type your questions into the Q&A. Um, yeah, this way we can eat more, more easily track and, and yes, exactly. at least the answered. questions that are in, in the chat. But while you do that, there's one from Li Yun 
Yun Lian uh, Yang. Uh, the question is a general question. How to determine whether a gene encodes not protein, but link RNA? So how do you know if a transcript is link RNA? Right. So, <laughs> so you can use the coding potential calculator to check whether it, uh, what is the potential of its getting encoded. So in our case, we also checked the coding potentials and we found that they are you no know, both the not 40 and done 40 are non-coding. So we have predicted it to be a long non-coding RNA. So yeah, we can check the coding potential only to check whether it's a coding RNA or this non-coding RNA. I wonder whether have you have you thought about um, or maybe somebody in your lab is doing this already, but um, seeing what else binds to um, Ash R three, you know what are it has that set domain and it binds to Dun forty, um, but can you go backwards and find its other partners? Uh. No, not that we are actually being now focused on the understanding the role of this antisense RNA. So maybe some other group or some other lab members will come up with these ACH3 interacting factors also. Yes, that's interesting. What are you thinking about with um, this long non-coding RNA? So this long what are the next RNA? questions. Uh, See, there uh, is uh, in other systems, it, is, it has been widely studied that these long non coding, uh, long non coding RNAs who interacts with the histone modifier interacts have various other protein complexes interacting with it. So, we are now actually looking in these other interacting factors also. So, there are, we have some preliminary data, and okay, so maybe soon we can come up with some other factors that may be interacting and we can predict some other more. We can focus on other models also. Yeah, I think that's going to be very interesting. So finally, we have, I mean, not finally, but next, we have a question from Goswell Su uh, Fang and Su Fang. He, he's asking, I mean, commenting that he loves the technical part of this study. And then he has a question about research and development from the research development perspective or from an application perspective. So if you are a person who is not a scientist, you're just a layman, like a farmer who is growing peanuts, right? So what's the take home message for, for that person? Or what can he or she mean, understand or benefit from, from your study? Yeah, I think that's something we all need to keep in mind when we carry out I mean, basic research and how, how you ultimately like might benefit the, uh, the practice of agriculture. Uh, see, uh, basically, peanut is a uh, very much economic, agriculturally and economically important uh, crop plant. So we have to, before we can focus on enriching its or uh, even, uh, develop its growth, we need to know about how they are fixing uh, at what is the mechanism of these basic things are root nodal symbiosis. So if we can know the pathway, then we can address the future also the how we can improve this uh, or utilize this plant as both as a fertilizer, which we can they fix the nitrogen. So yeah, so this is a one of the preliminary studies we can say that which we eventually help in uh, understanding its uh, major roles. We have one question in the Q and A from Igor Krivoruchko, who says, "Preetha, this is a great study." Um, Thank you. In Metacago truncatula, ENOD40 is known to be a protein coding transcript, really, I guess, peptide coding transcript. Um, and he's asking whether ENOD40 is a non coding transcript or whether, well, could you address that? So basically, ENOD40 has been studied as a non coding RNA, but since it has a potential to code uh, small peptides, so nowadays, if the people around on investigators around the world say that these are known as both coding non-coding RNAs, so or these are CNC RNAs that we, they have done. So yeah, we can say that not 40 can be uh, can, we can say that not 40 can be both coding and non-coding, but it's a CNC RNA. And I yeah, honestly that's think that's the first one I ever ever read about was Enon 40. 
being both a long non-coding RNA and something that encodes peptides. And that was controversy for years, but it looks like it can do both. Yeah, that's what we were talking before before the seminar started that we were chatting that Enox 40 is such one with, with such a long and uh, long history. But it's quite clear that the, this anti-sense is down 40. This is entirely non-coding, right? Yeah, it's, it's entirely non-coding. It doesn't have any such coding potential. Yeah. Yeah. That makes things easier, right? <laughs> and I know long non-coding RNAs are tend not to be that conserved between um, different plant species, except for very closely related. So, um, so it's, it's interesting. I wonder where that level of regulation came in um, and how widespread it's going to be. That's going to be a very interesting question. Well, oh, we have more in the Q&A now. Right, so Gustav is asking another question, whether you know down 40 is involved in phase transitions. So, so now there's this such a hot, hot topic of, of liquid, liquid liquid phase transitions, right? Yeah. Inside, inside cells. And yeah. very often because in proteins and large molecules aggregate. So do you know if in down 40 could so be involved? That's a very relevant and as well. well as that's a very relevant and interesting question. But yeah, uh, it's too early to predict that it's uh, whether it helps in this phase transition. But yeah, we can definitely address to this in future times. It's a very interesting question and very relevant at this moment. It is a good question. Um, our next question is from Igor Krivoruchko again, who notes that it may be, it's really more of a comment. It may be interesting to check if the peptides encoded by the sense transcript physically interact with the anti-sense transcript. So yeah, what is the function of those peptides? That's yeah, still that a big can mystery. Be also. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, this has been a terrific talk. I think we have um, come to the end of uh, of our questions. If I so, may, I may I insert one last question here? Absolutely. So I was looking at your Figure Five when you look at the in chromatin modification at the in our forty in loci in, in peanuts. But uh, do you think the effect of down forty and the, uh, the protein ASHR three right? Is it mostly locally on in not forty lo loci, or is it more a global regulation uh, of have, chromatin? Yeah, we have not checked the global effect of this ASHR three. We have just focused on this in not forty loci, so we can say that. We have just wanted to predict whether it acts as a responsive element. So we have just focused on this in not 40 loci only. So the global uh, scenario of this h 36 trimethylation is yet to be understood. We have yeah. not checked it over there. Yeah. Well, this is a terrific talk because as you can see, it took us all the way from this very interesting observation just from gazing at the transcriptomics, seeing that there is an anti-sense RNA all the way through to um, its binding partner, the fact that it's targeted back to that locus and affects histone methylation. Um, and yeah, it, and that um, the gene itself may be a target for polycomb trithorax. So it's just really a wonderful story taking all the way from this observation through to real mechanism and, and possibly getting to some really important things like um, Dong was just talking about with phase transitions. So I can't wait to see where this takes, uh, takes uh, the lab next and also to see what Pritha's next steps are since she is completing her PhD and will soon be moving on to a postdoc. So um, if we could, Dong, let's thank Pritha. Thank you so much. So thanks to everyone and please check back. Uh, if you go back to the same place where you registered for the talk, you will be able to find the recording um, probably in about a day. And um, I think, I don't know if that has been typed into the chat yet, but that will be an easy thing. There you go, recording will be posted here. And Karen, if you could also post the link to the paper, because one thing I wanna remind people is that if this intrigued you, remember, 
the details are all in the manuscript and there's lots of great stuff and even more great stuff in the supplemental data. So lots of interesting things. Okay, yes, you can see the link for the article there. So anyway, I'm very excited to uh, host this, um, another great talk, another great paper from the MPMI Journal and to have another, another good talk. And I think that this talk will be, this recording will be one that people will be um, coming back to again and again. Lots I agree. of interesting work fabulous. There. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you for okay. joining us. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Bye everyone.